Joined as always by Buffalo Controller Mark Schroeder. Our top story today, an audit of overtime in the police defar department found that civilian employees average more overtime than uniformed officers. Now Mark, you found that civilian employees like your dispatchers and your janitors earn roughly about 8.6 hours of overtime per week, while your uniformed officers, your police officers, lieutenants, captains, they're earning about 5.3 hours. Now, your audit pointed out that since these civilian job titles are easier to fill, you don't have to uh, train these civilian employees right. as much as you do a police officer, That's right. that the staffing levels should be more easily adjusted to fit the staffing needs, and there shouldn't be these extreme cases where employees are earning double their salary in overtime. Yeah, so, so first of all, to, to me, common sense would dictate that it's inevitable that police officers, there is going to be a time uh, when there's going to be overtime. If you think about it, you know, police officers, they have to be physically ready each and every day. So if they're not feeling well or if they have a sprained ankle, um, therefore it's important for them, for the city and their families that they do not go to work that day. Patrick, regarding civilians, it's ridiculous. It's actually ridiculous. With police officers, it's less than 20% overtime. With civilians, it's over 50% getting overtime. That is mismanagement. And so my suggestion would be to the mayor and to the police commissioner, you need to do a better job of staffing uh, because it just doesn't make sense based on what the audit, and this isn't just an audit of the last month. This is over a two year period. And so therefore, uh, it seems to me that management needs to do a better job in scheduling civilian workers or having an adequate workforce. Now, the police department, the, the uh, amount of overtime they get averages about $14 million per year. It's one of the larger uh, departments uh, in the city of Buffalo as far as overtime usage. And you know, due to the 24-7 operation of a police yeah. officer, uh, it's reasonable that there be some overtime. But the overtime is approximately two and a half times as much OT as the city of Rochester's police department. And, and, and part of this is um, waiting for people to uh, qualify and get trained. But, and, and they can't always hire police officers. And the fire department's actually in a better spot. They brought on a bunch of firefighters recently, and yeah. their overtime has gotten down. The police, that won't happen for a couple more years, but where they can make this mark and they can do the reduction is in the civilian force yeah. where it's easier to maintain adequate staff. Yeah, but Patrick, again, I, I just want to be clear to, to the viewers. Uh, again, this is another case of mismanagement. Um, you know, I, I know from a national perspective, there's been a lot of dialogue about police officers. I get it, I understand it. Uh, but you, you also know, Patrick, I go to every single neighborhood in the city of Buffalo, and I have been to several church services uh, on the east side of Buffalo in particular, and where pastors are lauding first responders, uh, police officers, fire officers, peacemakers who are trying to do their best in our city. And so therefore, you know, what I said earlier, obviously it's inevitable that there's going to be some overtime attached to police officers. But what I'm looking at in this audit um, can, uh, it, it, should, it should go away. There's, there's no reason why it should continue this way. It's mismanagement. And so I would, uh, I would suggest to the mayor and to the com uh, police commissioner to get together. Even if you want to look deeper into the audit, uh, the city auditor uh, and our department, our division of audit, is suggesting that maybe they even ought to think about having a finance director, uh, somebody who understands the ledger sheet and understands how to balance. And so I think that's a good idea. For instance, you know, I know from working with the leadership of the PBA, the union, I know for a fact that on their management team, on the PBA, there is an accountant. And that accountant, I know he's an accountant 
based on some of the questions that he raises and that he talks about. And so therefore, I think the city auditor and the audit department are correct based on what we know over this two-year audit that maybe somebody with, so, with an idea uh, of, of, of financial uh, you know, acumen should, should be in there taking a look at these numbers. Another thing your audit found is that some employees earn more than $100,000 just in overtime. That's not total. That doesn't include their salary, but um, three in fiscal year 15 earned uh, more than 100000 and a uh, significant amount, 50 in that same year, or more than 50000 So another thing your audit mentions is that some of this overtime should be spread around to more employees so that the burden doesn't fall on so few employees earning a lot of overtime, rather spread it out so uh, you wouldn't have overworked employees in, in, yeah. in, one, in one case, and also uh, will give other employees the opportunity to earn yeah. overtime. A again, th you know, this is where management comes in. Um, if you're allowed to do whatever it is you want to do, that's what you're going to do. If management comes in and says, hey, listen, we want to put in some standards here, uh, then it's a whole different story. And again, I just, I just want to be clear to the viewers. Um, you know, I don't mind offering constructive criticism uh, to the administration, and I often do. Uh, but I want to be c very clear about this. Uh, police officers are somebody who have a very, very difficult job. And so this audit really isn't so much about them. It's really about the civilians who are working in the police department and who are having 50% or more overtime. Uh, and to me, that's mismanagement. That should be looked at. And it's costing the city of Buffalo uh, nearly, you know, six million dollars over a two-year period, uh, and so I think that's a lot of money, and that the management ought to look at that. And just on that point, if there was a chart in your audit that charts out each specific job title and the amount of overtime each get, the top four titles, as far as overtime, were all civilian, and uh, 14 of the top 20 were were all civilian, whereas police officers we're 15th on the list uh, as yeah. far as making overtime. So, yeah. the, you know, while the numbers of, uh, you know, there's more police officers and, and they might have more total hours of overtime, uh, you know, as compared to your average salary, it's, it's these uh, civilian positions where there really needs to be uh, additional hires. And, and, yeah. and, and you also did a, a study that shows that uh, break even point where it would, uh, it, where officers are concerned, um, where it would be six weeks of overtime where that at that point it would actually save money to hire a new officer. Yeah. In, in your little overview in the beginning, you also mentioned how there are some slim similarities here with the fire. And so, and so in the beginning, when we were looking at some of the costs within the fire department, I knew that there were a lack of firefighters. And then the city of Buffalo, and to the mayor's credit and the council's credit, they did something about it. They put on 100 firefighters last year, right? And so I know that has curtailed uh, overtime. But where it's similar is that civilians in the fire department are also dominating the overtime. It's just plain wrong. It's mismanagement. Somebody needs to get in there, make an assessment, and lay down the new rules of engagement. And that is not happening. Even though we put in suggestions and the commissioners will write back to us and say they will adhere to our suggestions, uh, sometimes they don't, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, uh, but they should in terms of this. This is real easy. It's easy stuff. Now, one thing I, I'd like to point out, and we've talked about this before, is that your audit had found that the cell block attendants uh, make significantly less than similar positions in Western New York. And they're getting recruited to go to other places. That's why they're leaving. What they found was because the pay is so low, when uh, they get their experience with the city of Buffalo as a cell block attendant, they leave for Erie County or New York State or in another municipality because the... the uh, on average, they earn 20000 less starting salary. And if they make it a supervisor, they make 40000 less than yeah. a supervisor um, in other Western New York municipalities or the state. So y you, th you suggested that maybe uh, the city ought to look at increasing the salary for that position so that it would reduce 
the turnover and it would reduce uh, the amount of overtime that each employee is uh, yeah. needed, that needs to work because they have to fully staff the yeah. jail. No question. And the, the audit that we did on that, Patrick, was a little while ago, so I don't know if I remember all the details, but I think I do remember having a conversation with you that I think the time has come where the city and the county ought to reevaluate on the way that they're doing things now because it was a departure from how they were doing it. Over the last two years or so, the city of Buffalo has taken on the cell block attendance where before, um, I think it was a combination deal between the city and the county. And I'm not suggesting we should go back to that. What I am suggesting is when it's clearly not working, it's always a good idea to go back to the playbook and to figure out uh, either, either an old play that did work or maybe a new play. But to do nothing is a is really bad idea. And, and in the short time that the cell block attendant title has existed, there's been almost a wholesale changeover in the turnover there, and, and, it's, and it's almost a new force because it's so difficult to keep an employee at that position with such yeah. a low salary. Yeah. So again, clearly the commissioner and the mayor, they have a, res we have a responsibility to make an assessment and then do something about it. To do nothing is, uh, is, uh, is not a good idea. Another uh, thing your audit pointed out was that uh, while the city spends about 14 million in police overtime uh, per year, it only budgets for around nine. Now that's 40% uh, uh, that's 40% above what was budgeted is the actual amount. Now, to do this year after year, uh, it's not really good financial practices. It's, no. it's, uh, no. To understate your budget by 40% is uh, not giving the taxpayers at home and the community uh, the amount of information about you know what the uh, actual budget will be. Yeah, so you know, Patrick, as you know, I you know I was in the private sector for 25 years, and so I had responsibility to determine budgets. And what you want to do for your organization is you want to set yourself up for success. That's what you want to do. And by doing what you just said, uh, time after time. Uh, does the opposite and so it doesn't work and so what's discouraging to me is I am the voice to the um, to the rating agencies and to those who look at the city finances and so when I see occurrences like this uh, it's it's uh, disingenuous and really they, they ought to understand best practices and and do a better job in accounting uh, you know, for the budget um, for each and every department, and in this particular case, police. Now, you mentioned uh, other departments. You've done audits of the payroll uh, for nearly every department of the city, and if you haven't done one yet, you're going to be doing one soon. Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing that you found in these audits of payroll in every department is that the city's system of timekeeping is, is antiquated. Non-existent, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and you're being you, kind. And you've been, you've been pushing <laughs> yeah. for a new system. Um, and, and for a while, there wasn't much progress on that front, but, but now, uh, now you're seeing that there is some action being taken on replacing the city's timekeeping system with a more modern uh, approach to it, which could save taxpayers money, significant yeah. money. And so, and so I give a lot of credit to the 45 employees in audit and control in the controller's office because we identified this some time ago and we pushed and we pushed and we pushed. And I know how to use the bully pulpit uh, as well as anybody. And so even though it's not my decision to do this, uh, we wanted to make it very clear to the mayor, to the council president, to the council members that the time has come of doing it the Fred Flintstone way is not good. All it does, all it does, Patrick, is instigate fraud. People can be fraudulent when they know there's no system or there's a paper system. And, and, and people are then in charge of deciding who has what time and what hours and what overtime. It's wrong. Everywhere else, in the private sector, in the county of Erie, in the state of New York, if you are a civil servant, if you work for the government, you have to clock in and clock out. It's real simple. It's a simple premise. It's something that the city of Buffalo should have done a long time ago. And, and we, we take um, pride in knowing that we, in a gentle way, forced them to do this. And it is going to happen. Well, we got to take a brief break. Okay. When I get back, I want to talk about the uh, city exterminator and an interesting uh, 
interesting find by your auditors about uh, his second job yep. with the city. Sure. Stay tuned for more Controllers Corner after this message. Are you unemployed, underemployed, or do you need to improve your job skills? Then the Buffalo Employment and Training Center is here for you. The Buffalo Employment and Training Center is your one-stop employment shop. Whether you need help with your search, access to information, seminars, or training, our expert and caring staff is here for you. And the best part is, all of our services are free. The Buffalo Employment and Training Center is conveniently located at 77 Goodell Street in downtown Buffalo with plenty of free parking. For more information, call 856-JOBS or visit us on the web at www.workforcebuffalo.org. Hi, welcome back to Controller's Corner. Auditors in Controller Schroeder's department found that the head exterminator for the city was not only having a second job for the city while he was working consecutive double shifts, but was also working that second job when he was on sick leave from the city. Now, Mark, this head exterminator was uh, two summers ago uh, working consecutive double shifts. That's 16 hours on, eight off, 16 hours on, eight off, 16 hours on, yep. eight off, yep. 16 hours on, eight off, and uh, has actually earned overtime 10 days in a row in a 10 consecutive day span um, for 12 hour shifts after the 16 hour shifts and then a, a couple more uh, overtime days after that. While, while he was working those shifts and he only has eight hours per day that he wasn't working, uh, he was posting notices, in rem notices on houses at $12 a piece doing upwards of 80 notices per day on the same days he was working 16 oh. consecutive 16-hour yep. shifts. Now, your auditors found that at the time. They raised, uh, they raised the red flag and said, we shouldn't be paying this guy. It seems like he you know, could be doing this in-rem notices while we're paying him to do his exterminator job. Yep. Um, so uh, we haven't, the city hasn't paid him yet for the in-rem notices. But the next summer, this summer, he was leading up to his retirement. He took about a month worth of sick leave, sick leave and while he was out sick, he was also delivering up to 90 notices per yep. day, yep. earning up to $1,000 per day doing these notices while using his sick time. Now, sick time, according to the collective bargaining agreement for his union, uh, says that it, it, it should be used for a sickness or a physical disability, but you're contending that, well, if he was fine to deliver 97 notices yeah. in one day, he should have been yep. healthy enough to go to work. Yeah. So, so first of all, I just want to remind the viewers of what they know, what I told them, you know, five years ago when I became the controller, I asked a very simple question, how many employees do I have? They said 45, and I said, how many CPAs do I have? And the answer was one. I now have nine certified public accountants. I have the most professional controller's office in the history of Buffalo. And so I will tell you, Patrick, uh, the Buffalo News did a clip on this this morning. My name wasn't attached to it at all. I, had, I made no comments about it. And the reason why I didn't is because the auditors did their job. And my executive assistant, which is you, Patrick Curry, you had to clarify what was taking place. And so I want to make sure the viewers understand, this is not political, this is technical. This is an auditor seeing something that doesn't pass the smell test, which what you said, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, it, it's clear to me that what the auditors did was the right thing. They held it up. And then the city auditor, to his credit, he is not going to make any arbitrary decisions. So what he's going to do is pass it along to the Corporation Council and to the council members. Let them take a look at this. Let them make a determination. They're the policy makers within City Hall. The auditors did their job. They saw something that didn't look right. They stopped it and then they passed it along to the policy makers and said, you should make a decision on this. And so what I would suggest strongly to the council members, that it, it doesn't matter to me what decision they make as long as they make a decision, but that if there are certain loopholes that are found 
and the auditors identify something that's not right, the common council has the responsibility to close the loophole. And this is really what I'm hoping for right here. And I give the auditors and the city auditor a lot of credit for doing their job. Now, one of the things uh, that, you, that you pointed out was that, you know, when you're working 16-hour shifts and you only have an eight-hour break in between, it would be awfully hard to deliver all those notices um, and also sleep, eat, go to the store, uh, shower, do your yeah, basic yeah, functions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would be awful hard to cram all those, uh, all those actions in in this eight-hour span yeah, yeah, yeah. and also end that eight-hour span delivering up to you know, 80 to 90 uh, invoices. It's, it's, uh, yeah. it, like, as you said, doesn't really pass the smell test. No, no. It, you know, it is what it is, and th this is the reason why... Um, the controller is independently elected. This is why the controller has responsibility for three divisions, accounting, debt management, and auditing. And when an auditor, in this particular case, does his or her job, uh, it's important. And then when the leadership of audit says, good work, now let's have others take a look at this. And so it's clear to, it's clear to me and it should be clear to the public. There's no, there's no political intent here. It's all technical. It's all doing things best practices. And that's what we've talked about right from the beginning. That is why the 45 employees who work for me, the elected Buffalo City Controller, they devised their own mission statement. They devised their own vision statement. They're the ones who came up with the term transparency. And so this is A plus, good job audit, and, and, I, and, and we're going to continue to do good work. And your audit team, these auditors have also found other issues. Uh, as we talked about, there was an employee in the fire department who uh, was doing some improper things, and it was flagged by one of your auditors. And this is just another case of auditors doing their job and finding something, uh, going above and beyond the call of duty, yeah. and, and really giving that extra effort. And, and at the end of the day, if they expose uh, certain misdeeds and they save taxpayer money, it's, it's a job well done. Yeah, no, no, no question. And one, one of the things that we've said right from the beginning is that our responsibility is to be alert, focused. We know best practices and we're not afraid of anybody within City Hall. And so we do our job. We do it each and every day. And, uh, and, we, and we did a very good job on this. Switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about the teacher's contract. Yep. Now, you have a role within the Buffalo Public Schools as the si elected city controller. And recently, after 12 years of being without a contract, the teachers and the school district have agreed yep. on a new contract. Uh, there's some raises in the current year and the next yep. two fiscal years. Yes, there is. And the most important thing about this, and when, when you communicate to the rating agencies, this is what you stress, is that is that it takes the unpredictability out of out of it. And now, when there's a lingering contract that has uh, has not been agreed out upon, and it's 12 years yep. without a contract, there's a lot of uncertainty. When they do come to a contract, what is it going to be? Yep. And what are the what financial hit will the district take? And yep. the good news is that uh, you know the, the district has enough money to cover the cost of this yep. contract. Yeah. But the uncertainty now that has clouded. Uh, the city and the school district is gone because we know what the teachers are going to get paid. The contract is done and the guesswork is gone. Yeah. And, and, and now we can look at hard numbers and the rating agencies can judge us yeah. not on what could happen, but what did happen. Yeah, no question. And, and, and so um, the citizens of Buffalo, they know that I have a standing in the Buffalo Public Schools. They also know that we've gone to the refunding market a number of times and we've yielded over $100 million for the school district. However, um, I really don't have an intimate role in the contract. That's where the superintendent comes in, the elected board of uh, the, the Board of Education uh, and the union leaders. And so, but what my job is to know what the financial facts are. And as I was telling the crew here at the Apollo earlier today, 
uh, we play offense unlike the Buffalo Bills. And what we did is we played offense. We called the rating agencies and we said, we have some information to share with you. We want you to know that we have a superintendent who's the fifth superintendent in six years, but he's done what no other superintendent has done in 12 years, negotiate a contract. And guess what, rating agencies? He's figured out a way to pay for it also. And so we explained that over the last several days in the rating agencies. I don't want them ever to feel flat-footed that if they get a, asked a question uh, that they, they, they're unable to answer it. So I will tell you, uh, mission accomplished uh, to Ann Forty Sherino, my first deputy, uh, to Greg Samansky, our debt management officer. We did a good job in explaining this to the rating agencies so that they understand. And uh, luckily, the city uh, school district had put away a significant amount of money, $67 million, to cover the cost of this contract. Yeah, so over the years, Barbara Smith, who's a former CFO, and Jeff Pritchard, who is the current CFO, they uh, set aside $67.2 million. The expense side of this contract for the first two years is under that. Uh, is under that amount that they've set aside and that they also know that there's going to be some sa savings, some uh, realizations of savings going in the third year. And even, even the superintendent said on the radio the next day, the third year is going to be a little tight. But that's the third year. We have time and the school district has time. The governor, the Department of Budget, the state senate, the assembly, they all have time to take a look at this and to be helpful to the school district uh, so that they can make good on this contract. Twelve years without a contract is disrespectful to students, parents, and especially teachers. We only have a couple minutes left, but I did want to talk about the Buffalo Public Schools Adult Ed Division actually honored you this no. year. Uh, Viewers might not know, but before you were a controller, uh, when you were a state assemblyman and a county legislator, you founded uh, what's called the South Buffalo Education Center. Now that uh, that offers GED, which uh, now has been replaced by the TASC, yeah. but it, it offers high school equivalency classes and uh, testing help, and over 500 students earn their GED um, at the South Buffalo Education Center. and. Recently, the Adult Ed Division honored you at their annual Partners Breakfast for all the hard work you've done promoting high school equivalency diplomas and other adult education initiatives yeah. for people who might need a second chance. Yeah, so, so I know firsthand um, how grateful I am uh, for having a second chance. Um, I, I, didn't have a, uh, I didn't have a stellar career uh, as a student and I got my second chance in sixth grade at public school 72. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget the principal. I'll never forget what they did, the teachers did for me. So when I had a chance to do something similar in 2001, and the South Buffalo Education Center is still working at it at South Park High School, helping those who need a second chance. Uh, so I, I was very uh, grateful uh, to adult education. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, all of my partners who helped me uh, put this education center together uh, to give the young people a chance to get a high school equivalency, to get some job training, to get an opportunity to get a job and to help themselves and their family. I thank them for that honor that the Buffalo Public Schools gave me last week. Well, that's all the time we have for Controller's Corner. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And thanks at home for joining us. Make sure to check out the City of Controller's website at city-buffalo.com slash controller. Make sure you check out our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our Twitter handle. On behalf of Mark Schroeder, this is Pat Curry signing off.